Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll be getting started in just about a minute. Give it just one minute to let people jump on. And Josh, if you could mute everybody, that would be really helpful. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I see we got about 23 people on so far, so that's great. Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, this is the Path to Equity Policy Guide for Richmond Connects webinar. Um, I'm Kelly Rowan, Transit Planning and Mobility Consultant to the Office of Equitable Transit and Mobility um, within the City of Richmond Department of Public Works. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, and if it needs to be addressed right away, I've asked Josh to just interrupt me. Um, but we got a, a, a pretty packed um, meeting. And also, just a side note, we are recording um, this webinar for anybody that was unable to make today's meeting. I know there was a couple other conflicts. Um, and we also are planning... Um, three Facebook Live events that will be a very condensed version of this conversation um, Thursdays in January, starting this Thursday at four on our City of Richmond Facebook. So um, if you have friends or other folks that maybe didn't want to sit for the full presentation, um, send them over to the City of Richmond Facebook and they can find, we're making an event page for each of those right now so they can join that and, and keep that um, on their radar. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started again. If everyone could keep your lines when you did, that'd be great. Put questions in the chat. So today I wanted to go over kind of a, a, a who, what, when, where and why for the policy guide. I'll walk through some of what we heard in our survey, uh, what outreach we've done and sort of the next steps moving forward um, into the Richmond Connects full update. Um, and I'm also going to share a little bit about how to navigate the draft document that's available for public review. Um, give you kind of a little preview and a breakdown of the different sections of the plan. So first, I'm just going to start with a quick intro of who we are and how we got here. For those of you that haven't joined any of our previous engagement um, we are the Office of Equitable Transit and Mobility. 
um, seeing the need for an internal office focused on equitable multimodal planning, on equitable mobility and accessibility programming, and on ensuring transit equity, Mayor Sony formed our office in 2020. OETM is tasked with planning and programming um, for the multimodal transportation network in Richmond. Our office manages the shared mobility programs. So think bike share and scooters. Um, we also manage the city's multimodal plan, Richmond Connects, which we'll talk some about today. Um, our office also handles the transportation demand management programs, often abbreviated TDM. We also serve as a liaison to many other regional and local boards and commissions that deal in the planning uh, for Richmond's multimodal network. We are organized under the Department of Public Works. Um, and as a side note too, our office also manages Main Street Station. If you um, use Amtrak or come by there, um, and we operate that as both a multimodal hub and a revenue generating event space. So I always have to give a shout out to Main Street Station folks if you're interested. So what is Path to Equity? Path to Equity is part of an overall planning framework that will make up Richmond's multimodal strategic plan. It's comprised of the Path to Equity Policy Guide, uh, what we call the draft out now, uh, an action plan, and then a scenario plan. We kicked off the Path to Equity Policy Guide element this spring, the spring of 21, and we've got the draft out for public review. Um, it's important to note that this planning effort is fundamentally different from the 2013 planning effort. So there was the last Richmond Connects was in 2013. Um, it's fundamentally different in that it's it's uh, focusing on resolving or it's highlighting resolving problematic inequities in the transportation network for targeted underserved populations. This plan is also necessitated as progress has been made on many of the objectives and recommendations in that 2013 plan, thus the existing conditions are different than those that were documented in 2013. Also, since 2013, the city has completed a new master plan, Richmond 300, that lays out a, a new direction for the multimodal network. Overall, the transportation landscape, including technological improvements and socially valued core principles guiding transportation decision making, have changed in the last eight years, making this a much needed update. So kind of what is in each element? So the policy guide is the defining policy document. Some of you may have gotten a chance to pull it off the web already, um, but just as a refresher, a policy can be, can be defined as prudence or wisdom in the management of affairs a definite course or action or method of action selected from among alternatives and in light of given conditions to guide and determine present and future decisions. It can also be a high level overall plan embracing the general goals and acceptable procedures, especially of a governmental body. We feel like the path to equity policy guide really fulfills all of those functions. It's wisdom, it's a course of action, and it's a high level plan. So the element that's currently out for public review, Our the policy guide. Write-ups um, and case studies can we, on a feature tomorrow. Can we, can we uh, mute ourselves if you don't mind? Thanks. Sandy, I'm um, confused. Josh, can you mute everybody? So the, the element that's currently out for public review, the policy guide, it's also important to note that it reiterates, doesn't recreate the existing policy from the Richmond 300 master plan and the draft objectives from the RBA Green 2050 plan. So we don't you know, want to recreate the wheel, uh, but we did want to, to generate this guide to lay out some new policy statements, um, and those are in the form of equity factors and guiding principles. These more closely align the transportation goals, the existing goals and objectives with the equity agenda and will be used in addition to the existing policy. So it's not going to, um, it's not going to replace any of it. 
And yeah, we have somebody in the chat. Can we can we mute everybody, Josh, or somehow get, make the um, that little beeping stop? I'm not sure if we can do that, but we'll try. So then the, the next phase, the next phase, thanks, Josh. The next phase of the uh, of the Richmond Connects process will be the um, equitable mobility and accessibility action plan. So that's going to include the multimodal needs assessment. Um, with weight being given to the needs that impact equity per the equity factors that are those are articulated in the policy guide. So we want to know in that in that element, we want to look at what transportation needs are barriers to everyone reaching that same finish line. What needs are greatest for those areas and those groups of people that have been traditionally underserved? This will result in a list of top needs and a list of recommendations to meet those needs. We will then get into the scenario plan and look out to 2050 and we'll ask if we make large scale investments in X, Y, or Z type of transportation, what does that do for the overall network? And what does that do for our equitable transportation objectives? So it's going to test sets of investments for impacts to the Richmond 300 objectives and to the equity factors. So that's, um, you know, over the next, the next 18, 24 months, we're going to be working on um, beginning the full Richmond Connects phase, but we are right now in the public review phase of the first element, the policy guide. So I wanted to go a little bit over um, what we've been doing and how we got to this draft. So we began in early spring of 2021 um, scoping for this, this effort. We developed an outreach guide and we held a kickoff meeting of our steering committee. That's an internal city of Richmond um, group that helped guide the whole process. In July and August, um, we did a big engagement push. We had our survey was live um, and we did several engagement events that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and then in September, we came together with the results of that outreach that we had done to the larger uh, citywide audience and met with our advisory committee. Um, and we really worked on crafting that policy language. Um, and we included, you know, an additional analysis of the survey responses during that time as well. And then this, this fall into now, into this winter, we were reviewing um, had some back and forth on the equity factors, on our guiding principles. We're drafting the larger part of uh, kind of the meat of the plan, um, a lot of the background work. Uh, and we also um, have been doing some advertisement for our public review, which you guys are all participating in. So our steering committee met four times. Um, they helped scope the process. Um, they helped refine the outreach goals. They helped define the survey. They helped distribute the survey and they helped us refine the equity factor language. Um, the steering committee is the internal city of Richmond group with representation from all departments that have a stake in city planning. We also had an advisory committee. Um, that committee was a much larger group um, and it included local and regional planning partners, advocates from the social justice movements, and we had a set of citizen ambassadors that uh, we recruited to help represent the different neighborhoods in Richmond. Um, and those those folks were hired to serve on our committee. Um, and and anybody else that served in that committee as well, just a side note, as, as part of our commitment to equitable outreach, anybody who wasn't offered pay through their normal job was offered a stipend. So this group, the advisory committee um, and the steering committee will continue to meet throughout the Richmond Connects process. So over the summer, we had, like I mentioned, this robust engagement period. Um, despite being in the era of COVID, we um, tried to find ways to still go out into the community. Um, we did as much outreach, pretty much all of our outreach was either outside or online. Um, we still did some in-person stuff, uh, but it was pretty much all outside. And we really tried to bring the engagement um, outside into the communities rather than asking people to come to us. Um, we developed the survey and as part of our effort to, to get folks to do the survey, 
We held three tacos for transportation events. We had the first one at the Gilpin Field Day. We had the, sec the second one at Burr Park, and we had a last one over by the Blackwell Pool. Um, that was really fun. We had some local radio stations out too. Um, we also sent our friends with the snow cone truck and some canvassers to the back to school jam at Whitcomb and um, a national night out event. That was in early August. So we really tried to go out into the community. We also did, um, you can see here was we did um, a day of intercept surveying at high traffic bus stops. Um, we also had uh, had the paper copies available at libraries and other public locations. Um, and we, of course, did a large social media push as well. So we did get some media coverage. Um, we did some advertising with Radio 1. So we had two segments on with Community Clovia. Um, and we were picked up by a couple news stations. You know, we love that. Who doesn't love free press? Um, so overall, we had a, a, a pretty robust um, number of people that we reached um, just on the survey alone. So, you know, people that actually did the survey, not just people that also read some of the materials or heard our stories. Um, we had 1904 participants, 42 of those were in Spanish. Um, out of that total, 442 had never participated in a city uh, planning process before. The average income of our participants was estimated to be around $54,000 a year. Um, and 47% of our respondents earned below $45,000 a year. Um, and the city's median income in 2019 was $47,250. So we're in that range of being representative um, of, of the income distribution of our residents. Um, however, I will say we were a little bit more middle-aged. 53% um, were between 25 and 44, which is compared to 33% um, for 2019 numbers in that, in that uh, couple of age brackets. Uh, we also skewed a little bit towards women we had 57% that identified as a woman, 38% identified as a man, and 2% identified as non-binary. Um, in terms of race, uh, white, we are skewed a little bit towards white respondents. 52% um, of people that did our survey were white compared to only 45% of our residents. 30% um, of our participants were black or African-American compared to 47% of residents. And 96 per participants noted a Latinx um, ethnicity compared to, which is 5% compared to, and the city is 7.3%. Um, so lessons learned, um, social media is definitely the best bang for your buck, but it definitely produces a wider, more female identifying and more middle-aged respondents. So we have to work a little bit harder. Um, and, and I think our targets for transportation events were successful in reaching um, some of those different groups of people that we don't always necessarily reach well. Um, but we definitely also learned that we should join with events that are already on the ground. So that was kind of hard in the planning stages because there was still a restriction on gathering for COVID when we were planning these. So we weren't really sure if any of these other events were going to get to go ahead, but um, hopefully for Richmond Connects, we can join forces with um, other events that are already going on. Um, another lesson learned is that some people want to take a paper survey, no matter how snazzy the virtual one is. <laughs> so I think going forward, we'll prepare um, simpler versions of our surveys going forward to have as a paper copy. Uh, the survey that we had was pretty lengthy and it, and it was great to navigate online, but I think when it converted to paper, it was a little bit daunting to finish. So I think we'll do a simpler version um, for paper versions going forward. Um, and my other, my last lesson learned is that we should hire an intern by the time we do more paper surveys, <laughs> somebody that can input the responses, because um, that turned out to be, you know, pretty time consuming to convert all those paper copies into a digital copy. 
So what we heard um, from that survey, um, and, and you'll be able to see it when you review the plan that there's definitely a direct relationship between these top five injustices and the equity factor language. Um, we heard the number one ranked injustice was neighborhood dissection. And so neighborhood dissection, we're talking about um, the destruction of black and low income neighborhoods for the construction of freeways. Um, beginning in the 50s, this destroyed several blocks of Richmond neighborhoods, including parts of Jackson Ward and Carver by I-95 and 64, and Oregon Hill, Randolph, and Bird Park um, by the Downtown Expressway. So we still feel that today, uh, freeways isolate many Black and low-income neighborhoods from the city. So if you want to read more about any of these injustices, I invite you to... Um, to look to download or to look online at the path to equity um, policy guide. It does have a pretty big section devoted to going in more depth on these. And so the survey, the second highest ranked uh, injustice, so the second, the injustice that's um, impacting lives today uh, was redlining. And most of you probably know about what redlining is, but if you don't, um, when we talk about redlining, we're talking about the practice of the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s, um, where residential neighborhoods were given grades that reflected their mortgage security. Um, these neighborhood grades were color coded on maps. The green areas were the highest grade and were deemed minimal risk for banks and other lenders. Um, and those receiving the lowest grade of D were colored red and were considered hazardous. So hence the name redlining, those areas were mapped in red. Um, lenders would then often refuse to make loans in these areas or only on a very conservative basis. Um, so among the information that was used for grading the neighborhoods was quality of housing, recent history of sale and rent values, and very crucially, um, the racial and ethnic identity and class of residents that served as the basis of the neighborhood's grade. Um, so these maps and their accompanying documentation helped set the rules for nearly a century of real estate practice. Um, this redlining practice made it difficult or impossible for certain people in certain areas to access mortgage financing and thus to become a homeowner. Redlining directed both public and private capital to native born white families and away from African American and immigrant families. As home ownership was arguably the most significant means of intergenerational wealth building in the US in the 20th century, uh, this redlining practice from eight decades ago has had a long term effects in creating the inequities that we see today. So the next um, injustice that was ranked was the suburbanization of poverty. And for that, we're talking about um, the movement of lower income people to more affordable, but often auto dependent suburban communities. So as affordable housing has become less available in urban parts of the city, the most vulnerable are pushed into some of these older entering suburbs where they're further away from jobs and services. And then these areas also often lack comprehensive transit, bike, and pedestrian infrastructure. So again, if you want to read a little bit more about that, check out the draft. The fourth highest ranked injustice that we heard was urban renewal. Um, and I'm, most of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, but you know th these injustices include the clearing of black and low income neighborhoods to make room for some massive limited use buildings or uh, tore down existing neighborhoods to and replace it with lower density housing. Urban renewal projects in the city have targeted areas like Fulton, Randolph, and Jackson Ward. This has left many black and low income communities cut off from services that are enjoyed by historically white neighborhoods of a similar age, like the fan. So the last um, injustice that was the, the highest impact to people today um, was transportation planning. So, you know, calling out ourselves, I'm a transportation planner, um, but in the past transportation planning, the tools and the data that have been used 
Um, and a lot of that's just what has been available, but it, it's, you know, come a long way, but, but the tools and the data that have been used have favored automobiles um, and automobile traffic and really focused on on speed and um, reducing congestion and not so much on um, moving people to where they want to go and not really people focused. Um, so that's really resulted in a prior prioritization of high speed automobile traffic over bicycles, pedestrians and transit projects. Um, also, largely because of this focus on automobile speed, uh, racial minorities and low income people are more frequently killed by motorists and have less access to jobs and destinations without a car. Um, so that focus on vehicle speed and, and less on um, people centered uh, safety has resulted in, in some of these injustices. Um, so, like I said, you'll see when you review the plan, those are ref reflected directly in um, in the equity factors. So we also heard in the survey, we asked about barriers to access. And you can see on the left hand side, you know, obviously you can't tell from those, but that's just a little reference to in the plan. You can see these mapped um, by pedestrian, bicycle, transit, automobile. And then we also asked about access to services. Um, we also pulled out in, in the plan and have listed um, some of the kind of hot spots that will be um, addressed more closely in the Richmond Connects plan. Um, and I want to note that we're working to take that feedback that we got from our survey along with the feedback um, that was mapped as part of the Richmond 300 survey process. We're working to try and make that into a layer that we can um, a layer in a map that we can use when we develop the needs metrics and Richmond Connects and actually have that translate into, um, you know, it giving a higher priority to needs that are identified in areas where Richmonders have told us that, um, you know, they feel like those are the highest needs. So trying to make that direct connection. Um, so some of the major, uh, you can see on, on the slide, some of the barriers. Um, that people identified kind of by mood um, and some of the the uh, geographic location of, of some of the hot spots um, in Gilpin and Jackson Ward. Uh, people noted that the sidewalks were in poor condition um, and just in general, there's unkempt environments. In Chaco Valley, we heard there's dangerous crossings due to high speeds and interstate ramps. In Scott's addition, we heard um, high speeds and erratic drivers and there's no sidewalks. In Carytown, we heard the traffic was moving too fast for high pedestrian corridor. Um, in terms of bicycle barriers, we heard in Chaco Valley that, uh, again, high speeds, lack of bike lanes and difficult connections to the Capitol Trail. In terms of biking on Broad Street, we heard, you know, high speeds were an issue and again, a lack of bike lanes. Lombardi and Arthur Ashe were especially highlighted on that map. On Main Street, Cary Street corridor, um, bikers also again said high speeds and they noted that the closure of Bank Street has pushed cyclists to busier streets like Main and Cary. In Carytown, uh, for bikers, we heard again high speeds and the lack of adequate bike lanes. We heard on the Brook Road corridor that cars park in the bike lane. Um, we heard along Forest Hill that again high speeds are an issue and that bike lanes abruptly end. So for some transit hotspots, we heard the low frequency in Chaco Valley is a on low frequency and too many transfers in Church Hill. We heard from Manchester residents that they'd like more shelters and that there's too many transfers and again, too low frequency. We heard um, along the Arthur Ashe Boulevard, again, an issue with frequency. We did ask about automobile traffic, uh, travel rather, um, and folks in downtown and Chaco Valley thought that congestion was a problem and that parking was also a problem. 
on Broad Street, uh, people that were driving mostly or most commonly noted some pulse related movement issues. Um, they also, people that were driving felt like the high speeds on Main Street and Cary Street were problematic. Um, through Carytown, lots of people noted that it, people were still speeding and parking was an issue. People felt like the bike lanes on uh, Brook Road corridor were problematic for driving. Um, folks that lived along Forest Hill thought that people were speeding and construction was a problem. And then last, we asked about um, our service barrier. So barriers um, to getting to essential uh, shopping and other destinations. People that lived in Gilpin reported basically lacking all services. Jackson Moore residents noted most often that they had a hard time getting to grocery stores and healthcare. Um, folks in Manchester most often noted banks, groceries, and entertainment. And those were those um, were kind of the ones that just popped out in terms of, um, you can kind of see in the map, you know, the kind of hot spots. Um, and so we're, we're, you can see in the equity factors how that was, um, the barriers were also taken into consideration. Um, and again, we're, we're still going to keep using this survey data. We got a lot of like geographic specific data that we want to bring in when we're doing that needs assessment and the Richmond Connects plan. Um, but it definitely was all used and influenced how we crafted the equity factor language. So I'll pause just for one second and see if anybody has a question before I kind of go into um, what's in the path to equity plan. So, so I don't, if you have a question, if you could put it in the chat. I don't know if you can raise your hand on WebEx. But yeah, just put it in the chat. I don't see any questions. All right. Well, we will move into um, what is in the Path to Equity Policy Guide. Um, so this is really, uh, as you can see over here, basically the layout, the table of contents um, and shorthand um, of what's in the document. So some key elements include um, a large a large chunk of the document is devoted to explaining the injustices of the past and really serves to educate and raise awareness for the, the historical context of housing, land use, redevelopment, and transportation planning and programming that's resulted in the system and in the inequities in that system that we have today. Um, we also, in the kind of where are we now section, also explains the state and federal planning context um, and explain some of the barriers faced in alignment with those programs and with statutory requirements. So, you know, we can say all that we want in the path to equity and enrichment connects, but there's um, a, a milieu, if you will, of um, state and federal uh, legislation and, and planning context that we have to operate within. Um, and we try in the document kind of identify the pieces that are that are helpful and what is what hinders us getting to um, those equity outcomes that we articulated. Um, the plan then goes into, or the policy guide rather, then goes into kind of how do we envision the future? So we um, reiterate the Richmond 300 policy, the goals and objectives that relate to transportation. We also reiterate the RBA Green 2050 objectives, um, and those are are still in draft form, but we felt it was important to include those. Um, and we aligned that Richmond 300 policy and RBA Green policy with um, what we're calling investment need categories, and that's really designed to um, better to simplify rather when we get into Richmond Connects the connection between the existing policy and the metrics that we will choose. Um, it also simplifies the connection to the various uh, funding programs that are available. 
the meat, the meat of the, the new policy that we created uh, throughout the last year um, is really the equity factors and our guiding principles. So I invite you to check out that language um, when you review the plan. Um, the, the last part of the policy guide has a uh, overview of our outreach and some of the survey results that we got. Uh, and we also included um, some of the best practices that we reviewed um, and just what others have done kind of in this equity planning space. Um, just, um, you know, for reference and for anybody else that's interested in this sort of planning, um, we thought that was would be helpful to kind of get into our sources. So if you were to go and download the plan, you would get to an introduction uh, that just kind of gives an overview. And then you would get into the first main chapter, which is chapter two, and that's really looking at defining equity. Um, so we cover the Richmond equity agenda. We cover why we are going with equity over equality. We go into some philosophy around deficit thinking. Um, we give a little bit of context to what structural racism, white privilege, and anti-racism is. We have a little bit of background on Richmond and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that section also has a glossary of terms. Um, and then there's also the equity factors listed um, in that Actually, the equity factors are listed in the introduction. So if you're looking for just those, um, you can go to that first section of the document. Um, and I'll note also on the rba.gov forward slash path, the number two equity, which I put in the chat, you can also review just the equity factors and guiding principles if you're limited on time. Although I would encourage you to read the whole plan because it's really interesting um, and you probably learn, learn a little bit. I know I did when we were doing our outreach and doing all the research. So chapter three, which is about 15 pages, um, that's really the bulk of that discussion around the past um, transportation and land use injustices. Um, I'll also note in Starting in this section are these really awesome little call out boxes. If somebody's interested in maybe just checking out, you know, how has that kind of impacted my neighborhood? Uh, we have one for um, most all of the neighborhoods in Richmond. Um, and you can kind of check out, you know, how that impacts your area. There's also a timeline that has of the history of injustices. And that is, you know, not inclusive in any way. If we included every single piece of legislation, it would be like, you know, lots of pages, but there is a, a timeline of transportation and justices. If you're looking for just like a quick high level, like, you know, this is kind of the bam, bam, bam of what's happened um, since the thirties to get to where we are. So chapter four goes into a review of the existing plans and planning practices. And this, this part's only five pages, but it does give some of that context, like I mentioned earlier, of um, local the local context of what other planning is the city of Richmond doing and how does this kind of dovetail with that. Um, some of the regional context, um, like GRTC or Plan RVA, um, it gives a little bit of context into state and federal uh, multimodal transportation planning and how um, we think they are or not, you know, what elements they're including equity in their planning um, and how that kind of fits in with what we think should happen with equity and planning. Chapter five then gives um, some background on outreach um, and in uh, equitable outreach best practices um, and best practices and equity surveying. And, and we kind of talk about how we took those elements, you know, some critical items and how that helped shape, um, help shape our outreach um, and, and gives that chapter gives a little bit of information on, on what we heard and how we did our outreach.
So then chapter six is really the sort of policy chapter. That's where like the meat of, of all of the um, policy statements, including what's been re reiterated um, is contained. So you'll find in there, there's these tables that have Richmond 300 at the top and those include the Richmond 300 goals and the Richmond 300 objectives. And again, those are just crosswalk to some sets of uh, more tr traditional transportation investment need categories. Um, like I said, so later down the line, we can uh, align those with our metrics a little bit easier. Um, and we did that same crosswalk with the RVA green 2050 goals and objectives um, cross reference those. So I invite you to look at that and validate those linkages as well. Um, you'll also find the equity factors stated again. And then you'll also find these um, guiding principles um, that are really designed to uh, describe the process um, and sort of the dogma or the philosophy that should be applied as we're um, trying to implement all of these Richmond 300 RVA green and equity factors as we're trying to implement the objectives and equity factors, you know, we need to keep these things in mind. Um, and then the last chapter has um, some equity planning research. So, um, you know, again, some more of the uh, philosophy, um, if you will, behind some of the equity planning and the type of equity planning that we were working on. Um, it included things like, you know, targeted universalism and applied in King County, Washington, um, transit equity in Seattle, Department of Transportation. Um, we looked at um, some equity scoring research, looking at some transportation equity scorecards, um, for example, the one that the Center for Urban Transportation Research um, for Transportation Equity Decisions in Dollars that they developed. Um, we looked at the Green and Lighting Institute's Mobility Equity Framework. We looked at Smart Growth America's Project Scorecard. We looked at some um, equity data collection research from Puget Sound Sage. Um, they're a nonprofit out of Seattle, Washington. Um, we looked at some of the guidance documents that the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, um, often referred to as GAIR, some of the stuff they've developed, um, and their racial equity tool. I'd encourage you to check out that section if you want to, um, you know, find some sources and dig deeper. Um, maybe you're looking about thinking about doing this with some of your planning. Um, there's all kinds of resources available out there. Um, and I would encourage you to check out GARE um, if you represent a, a government institute and think about joining that organization. So yeah, that's the breakdown of what's in the document. Um, this is the website, rva.gov forward slash path, the number two equity. Um, it's embedded as a review. Uh, you can do it directly there and add comments throughout the document. Um, you can also download the PDF. And if if um, you need to get that to me, um, if you don't want to go back into the comment portal, my email is on, on the next slide or on the last slide. Um, so just quickly help navigating the document. So when you go to the web page, you'll be able to, there's two drop downs. The second one is to get the full document. Um, and I have this little arrow here because I know a couple of people are having a hard time figuring out how to download it. So you click on that download arrow and that will let you get a PDF. But you can also zoom around um, and click through the document and you'll select that icon and you can leave a comment and other people can comment on your comment. It's a really great collaborative um, way to have a public review. Also on that review portal, you can, if you're short on time, the first drop down box, again, this is at rva.gov forward slash path to equity. 
Um, you can review just the equity factors um, and same thing you can download here. You can click throughout and add comments. You can also review just the guiding principles. Um, so if you're short on time, you want to look at just the equity factors and guiding principles that are right in the first drop down. Um, and again, same comment portal. So our, our, you know, our immediate next steps, we will leave the document up till the end of this month. Um, then we'll finalize that as a PDF version and post it online. Um, and then we're working behind the scenes right now to create um, a framework for our website to have the plan content be um, at least a little bit more navigable than just a PDF document. So we're working on that. Next steps in terms of, you know, from here until spring and early summer, we've got uh, the public review period, this webinar, uh, the mayor announced on last week that this is out for public review. Like I said, we are having three little mini sessions on Facebook Live uh, on the 13th, which is this Thursday, and then the following Thursday and the following Thursday. Um, they'll be at different times. The one on this Thursday, I think we're shooting for four. The one next Thursday, we're shooting for around six. So people that work a daytime job. And then um, the 27th, we're shooting for 11 a.m. So follow the City of Richmond's Facebook page for info on those. Um, do share. Um, we also um, are, uh, Dirana, the OETM administrator, is presenting to the Land Use, Housing, and Transportation Council Committee. Um, she'll brief them on this draft. Um, and then we are in house working to finalize um, the full Richmond Connect scope. Um, we are then next month and the following month working to finalize that document and get it up online, uh, presenting the final to the LUHT T committee and hopefully kicking off the Richmond Connects process. Um, then coming this spring and early summer, we'll hope to begin our Richmond Connects outreach. And really the first element that we'll be working on is developing those metrics. So hopefully we'll have some um, fun ways to get engaged with that next step. Um, and with that, I will put up my contact info. Um, and I'm going to actually put my cell phone in the chat because this number is supposed to go to my cell phone, but it didn't work this morning. So I'm putting my cell phone in the chat if you're on here and would like it. Feel free to give me a call, text, email. I'm at kelly.rowan at rva.gov. Um, if you have trouble um, getting the document and you want a paper copy, I know we have some printed up at our office, which is um, 1500 East Franklin Street. So if you're looking at Main Street Station, if you go under the 95, uh, under this highway bridge is the Seaboard Building, um, and we're under there, you can just knock on the door and um, we've got a few copies printed up. Again, follow us on our City of Richmond Facebook page. We'll keep you updated. Um, we appreciate everyone joining today, and I'll open the floor to questions. Hey, Kelly, we have a question from LaToya Grace Sparks. Uh, she asks, has the community engagement process for this initiative specifically focused on residents who are directly impacted by these destructive planning interventions or their descendants? And I was wondering if you could expand on our like, targeted outreach approach and, and maybe what might be coming up in the Richmond Connects process for this as well. Yeah, so we did, we had one of our engagement events was in Gilpin. Um, and so there was some uh, targeted, you know, advertising for that event. Um, we also have representation from um, all of those communities on our advisory committee, we have people that um, live in in um, almost every area of Richmond, um, or I might say every area. We have somebody from each from each district um, on that committee that were just citizen experts that we 
not really experts, but just regular everyday citizens that we sent out a call. Several of them are also on our Office of Community Wealth Building Ambassador list. Um, so a lot of those folks um, live in the uh, housing communities that were in, that were created as um, a part of a lot of these processes. Um, I think moving forward, you know, I'll say. One lesson learned um, that was really in Gilpin, like I said, was that like people really want to do the survey on paper. Um, so trying to, you know, do more targeted outreach with a paper copy into those areas is definitely on our radar. We're also working with um, a small uh, or, or talking to a small outreach. Um, business in Richmond and trying to get her to come up with, um, you know, some sort of neighborhood, smaller neighborhood meeting um, outreach uh, for the recommendation development and those steps in the Richmond Connects process um, and trying to have as much, you know, like true decision making being held by those smaller groups. We've also scoped out for Richmond Connects doing some smaller focus groups. Um, but for the, the Path to Equity Plan, um, we did that one event in Gilpin. Uh, the other event that was over by Blackwell Pool um, targeted some of these same areas. But in terms of the, the internet outreach that we did, the social media, like I said, it definitely skewed towards wider and more middle-aged. Um, we did try and, you know, do some targeted um, advertising to the groups that we weren't getting good representation from. And we did partner with, um, now I can't think of their name, the radio station, uh, that's a Spanish speaking radio station um, in an attempt to kind of boost those Latino number since that that's tends to be a really hard group for us to um, have outreach to um, but i think in terms of the if you look at the number of responses that we got from the areas of it that um were kind of pinged as the highest injustices that those overlap like the number of responses let me go back to these maps So you can kind of see like, you know, the, the density of responses is definitely in these core downtown areas where most of these injustices occurred. I hope that that answered your question. That was a very long answer. <laughs> And you can, she, I don't know if they can unmute. Whoever asked that, you can unmute if I didn't answer that and you want to ask me something else or in a different way. Cool. Let me put my contact info back up. Did anybody else have a question, Josh, or if anybody, I don't know, because if you can raise your hand in this platform or just unmute. Nothing typed up yet. Well, awesome. I'll put my email in the chat too, if that makes it easier for people to copy it. All right, well, I put myself in the chat and my email in the chat. So feel free to reach out if you have more questions, you want more information, you need to get a stack of the plan. We could bring you up some copies or we have some, you know, little pamphlets if you want to help uh, spread the word. 
Um, if you have any questions as you're reviewing the document or the equity factors, um, you know, just let me know. Um, and before you jump out, if if you wouldn't mind, everybody that's in the in the uh, participant list, if you could drop your name and your email, if you want to if you want to stay in touch, if you drop your name and your email in the chat, that would be really helpful um, for us keeping track. Um, and Josh, I don't know if there's a way to like copy the participants list, but that would be helpful too, just so we can keep track of who we talk to. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if everybody can do that, yeah, throw your name and email in the chat, that would be super helpful. And then jump, go ahead and jump off and get back to your day. And I really appreciate it. Um, I think we're doing great things in the city of Richmond. I'm so excited and honored to be a part of the team that got to work on this project. And a big thanks to Josh um, and to Dirana and our office um, for kind of giving us the leeway to uh, do something that I think is, you know, really progressive and really refreshing. And we're excited to continue this work. Thank you guys.
Bye, everyone. Have a good day.